You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Ladies and gentlemen, today is going to be quite a an eye-opener, I think. And uh, I think you're going to enjoy it. Remember, I've been telling you for years that the Illuminati are attempting to pull off one of the biggest hoaxes of all time. They're trying to tell us that Jesus did not die on the cross, that he was married to Mary Magdalene, that they bore a child. That child was taken to the British Isles where it grew up to found the Merovingian bloodline of kings, which uh, became eventually the House of Stuart. And that in the coming New World Order, they will present a Messiah to the world who will ascend to the throne of the world. Of course, the real power will reside in a council of wise men behind the throne. And uh, all nation states will cease to exist. There will be regional governments with parliaments, etc., etc., etc. You know, I've been telling you this for years. You've all been telling me that I'm crazy. And uh, today, <laughs> I'm going to give you verification from one of the highest members of what is known today as the Illuminati, Mr. Lawrence Gardner. And uh, I think you're going to find today's broadcast quite illuminating, <laughs> to say the least. Don't go away. I'll be right back after this short pause. Thank you. 
been trying for years, folks. And if I could, I certainly will, and I'm still trying. But I know that some of you are finally catching on, but many of you are still left in the dark, so to speak. Lawrence Gardner recently wrote a book called Bloodline of the Holy Grail, The Hidden Lineage of Jesus Revealed, with a foreword by Prince Michael of Albany. Lawrence Gardner is the prior of the Celtic Church's sacred kindred of St. Columba. He is an internationally known sovereign and chivalric genealogist. He's distinguished as the Chevalier Labran de Saint Germain. He is President Attaché to the European Council of Princes, a constitutional advisory body established in 1946. He is formally attached to the Noble Household Guard of the Royal House of Stuart, founded at St. Germain in Ley in 1692. And uh, listen to this very carefully. He is currently the Jacobite Historiographer Royal. Jacobite, ladies and gentlemen, is another word for Illuminati, which means that this man is in charge of the royal history for the Illuminati. And so what he says means something. And you're going to have to make up your own mind about exactly what it means. But basically what he is saying and what the Illuminati is trying to pull off in the world is that there is a secret bloodline that has been protected by the Knights Templars and by an organization called the Prairie de Sion and uh, many others, and that this history is known to the secret societies, Freemasonry and uh, the ancient order of Rosai Crusai, the Knights Templars, the Sovereign and Military Order, the Knights of Malta, and uh, many others. And that this bloodline has, according to the established lineage of the Bible, the Holy Bible of Christianity, the divine right of rule over all of the people in the world. Because this lineage, they say, is descended directly from the house of David through Jesus, who they say did not die on the cross, but married Mary Magdalene, who bore a child, or maybe several children, who were taken by Joseph of Arimathea to the British Isles, Scotland, Ireland, and of course Great Britain, where they founded the Merovingian line of kings, which eventually, through tables and many, many tables of genealogy, there are so many tables of genealogy in this book, and in many others that I have studied that also say the same thing, eventually established the house, the royal house of Stuart. And that that is the <laughs> ultimate goal of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry and many other of the secret societies is to reseat this bloodline, one of the descendants of this bloodline, upon the throne of the world as a messiah. Now, I'm not trying to tell you to believe this because I'm telling you it's a bunch of it's a crock of crap is what it is. <laughs> It's been used over the centuries to establish the legitimacy of the Anglican Church and establish an alternative uh, by the secret societies to the kings and queens that have traditionally ruled. And, of course, their ultimate goal is to destroy Christianity and topple the Pope off his throne and uh, create a one-world government uh, that will really be ruled behind the scenes by what they call a, a uh, benevolent dictatorship of a council of wise men, of course, which will not be visible to the public, but this Messiah will be placed out here to sort of look out after the public good. At least that's what the public is supposed to think that he's doing. But there's something wrong with this. I mean, it's really wrong. The whole thing is designed to bring down all segments and all churches and all of the believers of 
of the Christian faith. Because if Jesus Christ did not die on the cross, and if he did indeed marry Mary Magdalene and bear children, and of course if they can make everybody believe this, then Christianity is dead. It is no more. But the problem is this, is that they base everything that they say upon the Holy Bible. Which we all know, if you prove any one part of it to be wrong, and if you, if you prove that the New Testament is wrong and that Jesus Christ did not die on the cross, and I'm not telling you to believe that he did, this is not a religious broadcast, so don't get all up in arms if, if you don't believe in Christianity. What I'm trying to tell you is one of the ultimate goals of the secret societies is to destroy all religions, and no matter what religion you believe in, if it's not the humanist religion of the Illuminati, you're scheduled for dis, uh, extinction also. So you better listen to what I got to say. But the main target is Christianity. Because Christianity has been their biggest enemy over the centuries. And their God, of course, as you have learned on this broadcast, is Lucifer. So, if they prove that the New Testament is wrong, they've also destroyed the foundation of their claim to the throne of the world. You see, but most people don't understand that. It's all based upon the biblical line of the right to rule that was given to the house of David by God. And if all of that falls apart because somebody can prove that the Holy Bible is wrong, a lot of people already think they can, then their whole claim to the throne of the world is lost. It's gone. It's just so much BS, crapola. Just another lie. But that's what they're trying to tell us, and I'm going to give you a book report today on this book. I'm going to uh, read a portion of it to you called The Sangrail Today. Sangrail, of course, means the Holy Grail, which they claim is the holy blood of the ancestral line or the genealogy of the house of David through Jesus. And uh, this is chapter 20 in the book. It's called The Bloodline Conspiracy, The Sangrail Today. This was written by Lawrence Gardner. And the title of the book, in case you'd like to get a copy, and I hope you do and read it, so that you'll catch on to the baloney that's in here. This isn't the only one, folks. We're being flooded with books that pretend to prove that this is true. And pretty song soon they'll come forward with someone who they will say is a direct descendant by blood of Jesus the Christ who will then be placed upon the throne of the world. He will in fact be the Antichrist if you're a Christian and believe in the prophecy of the book of Revelation and also the book of Daniel. But this is called Bloodline of the Holy Grail, the Hidden Lineage of Jesus Revealed by Lawrence Gardner. There are many others. Holy Blood, Holy Grail by Lee Bajant and Lincoln. Also the, uh, the um, uh, Temple in the Grail by the same three. And the Messianic Legacy also by uh, Lee Bajant and Lincoln. So, here we go. Listen carefully. And I'm quoting directly from this book. This is a book report. Hopefully you will run out and buy it and read it and... and uh, Use your brain to interpret what's really going on here. It's part of a monstrous plot. These days it is generally understood that establishment history is largely based on recorded propaganda. It was originally compiled to suit the political needs of the era when written rather than necessarily being an accurate record of events. In short, it is generally a slanted version of the truth. For example, the English historical version of the 1415 Battle of Agincourt understandably differs from that of the French viewpoint. Similarly, the Christian perception of the Crusades is not necessarily shared by the Muslims. There are at least two sides to most stories. In 1763, the journalist John Wilkes accused George III's government of misrepresenting facts in the King's speech. Today, such challenges are common enough. But Wilkes was seized and flung into the Tower of London. In those days, there was no freedom of speech or opinion. Yet, during that same period of constraint, a vast amount of government-approved history was produced. 
Gradually, over the years of the 20th century, the official registers of nobility have been revised to correct a multiplicity of errors in past editions. But many of the errors, some still not fully corrected, were not mistakes as such in the first place. They were purposeful misrepresentations. As a direct result of Hanoverian, that's Georgian and Victorian policy, for instance, it has long been claimed in Britain that the Stuart succession became extinct while in exile. British history books are pretty well unanimous in stating that Charles Edward Stuart had no wife at his death and no legitimate male offspring. But they are quite wrong, and the continental European records tell a very different story. According to doctrinal English opinion, the present heir to the royal house of Stuart is Prince Franz of Bavaria, who is said to inherit the Scottish honors by virtue of the last will and testament of Charles Edward's younger brother, Cardinal Henry de Jure, Duke of York. This will supposedly nominated Charles Emmanuel IV of Sardinia as the Stuart successor. By way of marriage in the female line of descent from Charles Emmanuel's brother, Victor Emmanuel I, the present Franz of Bavaria succeeds his father, the late Prince Albert, relying in this on a somewhat tenuous ancestry back to Henrietta, a daughter of Charles I. The fact is, however, that Cardinal Henry Stuart's will did not name Charles Emmanuel as his successor. This is a complete fantasy that has made its way into the history books, but it was originally a purposely contrived deception on the part of Georgian politicians, a deception perpetuated by the later Victorian ministers. From the time that the Elector of Hanover began his reign as King George I of Britain in 1714, it became politically expedient to suppress or veil a good deal of information about certain families while enhancing the lineage of others. The House of Stuart came under particular attack in order to justify the incoming German succession. Even today, history books repeat the nonsense contrived contemporarily and afterwards to discredit the Scots dynasty and its associated families. The fabrications are so well ingrained that they are destined to prevail for as long as historical authors continue to copy from one another. Charles Edward Stuart was married in 1772 to Princess Louise Maximilienne, the daughter of Gustavus Prince de Stolberg Gudirn in 1784. However, papal dispensation for divorce was obtained following Louise's affair with the Italian poet Vittorio, Count Alfieri. Louise had been declared barren by the doctors, and after a few years of marriage, she left Charles in 1780 to take up residence with her lover. The divorce is frequently described as the end of married life for Charles Edward, but it was not. The Stuart archives in Rome and Brussels reveal that in November of 1785, Charles was married again to the Comtesse de Mathelin at the Santi Apostoli in Rome. She was Marguerite Marie Therese Odia de Audibert de Lucerne, a cousin by descent from Charles's grand uncle, King Charles II. Until 1769, she had been a ward of her own grand uncle, Louis Jacques de Audibert, Archbishop of Bordeaux. Marguerite's paternal grandmother, Teresa, Marquesa de Aberni, was the daughter of James de Rohano Stuardo, Prince of Bavaria, Marquis de Aberni. He was the natural son, legitimated in 1667, of King Charles II and Marguerite, Duchessa de Rohan. On her mother's side, Marguerite de Massillon was descended to the Comte de Lucerne. In November of 1786, the 37-year-old Countess gave birth to a son, Edward Jacques Stuardo, or Edward James Stuart, who became known as Count Stuarton. Although no secret in Europe, 
news of Charles Edward's legitimate son and heir was immediately suppressed by the Hanoverian government at Westminster. He has consequently since been totally neglected by academic historians in Britain. In that same month, Charles Edward's daughter, Charlotte of Albany, born 1753, by Clementina Walkinshaw of Borrowfield, met King George III's brother, William, Duke of Gloucester, at the house of Prince Santa Croce in Rome. Concerned about the strength of her own position as Charles Edward's legitimate offspring, she informed Gloucester of the royal birth and sought his advice. The Duke confided that Charlotte's status was probably safe enough, but his main concern was a letter that had been sent to her father by King George III in 1784. This letter suggested that Charles Edward could return to Britain from exile as the Count of Albany, that's Scotland. Charles had declined the invitation, but the matter was now complicated by the newborn son who might well choose otherwise on becoming the second Count in due course. When Charles Edward died, a contrived substitution of wills enabled knowledge of both the marriage and the birth to be concealed from the British public, a concealment that was perpetuated through the Hanover saxe coburg era until the truth finally emerged in the 1970s, they claim. In 1784, Charles had made a will nominating his brother, Cardinal Henry de Jure, Duke of York, as his royal heir. Charlotte of Albany was to be the sole estate beneficiary. This is well enough documented in the historical biographies, but what those accounts fail to mention is that this was not Charles's final testament. It was superseded by another before his death. Not only was the fact of this later will concealed by the Georgian Parliament, but so too was the reason for its existence. In order to stabilize King George III's position, his politicians thought it expedient to end the problem of Stuart popularity in Britain by having the Scottish line declared extinct, particularly since the Jacobites had been so instrumental in the American War of Independence from 1775 to 1783, verification of what I've been telling you for years, folks, an enormous number of deprived Scots has immigrated to America following the subjugation of the Highlands after Culloden. They had not managed to regain their independence at home, but continued their cause from across the Atlantic, thereby aiding their fellow Americans to secure their own freedom from Hanoverian constraint. On 30 January 1788, the de jure King Charles III, fondly remembered as Bonnie Prince Charlie, died, aged 67, at the Muti Palazzo in Rome. Shortly before his death, he wrote his last will and testament. This was witnessed on 13 January 1788 by the Dominican Father O'Kelly and the Abbey Consolvi, both of whom were executors. The will stated that Charles's offspring Edward James and Charlotte were to be co-heirs of the estate. His son Edward was to succeed to the royal honors on his 16th birthday, and Cardinal Henry was to be temporary regent in the meantime. Now, following Charles Edward's demise, his ambitious brother Henry wasted no time in proclaiming himself King Henry I, or King Henry I, de jure of Scots, that would be the Ninth of England, and to support this claim, he produced not Charles's will of 1788, but his earlier will of 1784, which suited Britain's government, since the Cardinal was not likely to have any children. Both O'Kelly and Consalve were party to the intrigue in return for rapid promotion within the church, and soon afterwards the former became Dominican procurator, while the Abbey was raised to the Cardinalate. Now, Charlotte of Albany was provided with a home in Frascati, and the Moody Palazzo was retained for Marguerite de Massillon and Prince Edward. Also involved in the scheme was the Abbey James Placid Waters, procurator of the Benedictines in Rome. Now, by declaring himself King de Jure, Henry sought to nullify the immediate regency clause in his brother's will, but in January 1789, 
Henry made his own will in which he redressed his selfish strategy for the future. All his possessions and heritable status were bequeathed to Prince Edward James, that is, quote, to my nephew, Count Stuarton, end quote. Both Cardinal Ercole Consalvi and Cardinal Angelo Severini were privy to the will and were executors as attested in their memoirs. As it happened, Henry subsequently lost a great deal of his wealth in the French Revolution and during the Napoleonic advance into the Papal States. In 1799, he became a pensioner of the British Crown at the rate of £5,000 per annum, which is about $250,000 in today's terms. But in return, he was required to rewrite his will. At a joint meeting between Prince Edward, Comtesse Marguerite, and the Pope, a suitable rewording was agreed. The new will was made in 1802, but the inheritance still rested with Prince Edward. The revised document simply substituted the words, quote, to my nephew Count Stuarton, end quote, with, quote, in favor of that prince to whom it descends by virtue of de jure blood relationship, end quote. When Henry Stuart died in July 1807, King George and the British Parliament decided that the second will was actually less appropriate than the former. They therefore ignored the 1802 document and reverted to Henry's original will of 1789, and the press reported that Henry had made his uh, bequest to his relation, Count Stuarton, meaning, of course, Edward James. However, no one in England thought to inquire who this relation, Count Stuarton, might be. Having dealt with the first hurdle, the Hanoverian ministers then produced Henry's amended 1802 will. By virtue of its malleable nature, the wording, that is, in favor of that prince to whom it descends by virtue of de jure blood relationship, was strategically implemented in favor of Charles Emmanuel IV, ex-king of Sardinia. He had recently abdicated to join the Jesuit order, and so the Stuart legacy passed to a potentially childless monk. Charles Emmanuel duly wrote to King George's Parliament denouncing the nomination because he knew the Stuarts to be alive and well. Indeed, having lived with him in Sardinia from 1797, Marguerite and her son Edward were then resident at his house by the Corso in Rome. The correspondence was ignored at Westminster, and the whole issue was put under wraps in Britain. History now records the diverted succession as having progressed from Sardinia through Modena into Bavaria. The reality is that the legitimate royal house of Stuart exists today and has long been actively interested in European constitutional management. In 1809, a dispute over sovereign loyalties arose between two sons of George III. It became known as the War of the Brothers. Prince Edward, Duke of Kent, the father of Queen Victoria, was a Freemason, while his brother, Prince Augustus Frederick, Duke of Sussex, was a Knight Templar. Edward's problem was that his brother's Templar colleagues were Stuart supporters. He therefore endeavored to sway their allegiance to the reigning House of Hanover. In the event, he failed, but compromised by creating a Templar-styled branch within the existing Masonic structure. This fell under the protectorate of Kent and followed the English York Rite of Freemasonry. The chivalric Templars pursued the Scottish Rite, under the protectorate of Prince Edward James Stuart, second count of Albany. There he verifies years of research that I've done that I have given you over this broadcast. I continue. While the exiled Stuarts were in France and Italy, they were deeply involved with the general growth and dissemination of Freemasonry, and they were the instigators of the exported Scottish Rite, which had higher degrees and held more profound mysteries than other Masonic systems. Prominent in this movement was Charles Edwards' cousin and mentor, the Comte de Saint-Germain. The Stuarts' involvement was firmly based on established rights and privileges with a desire to initiate brethren into the true antiquity and pedigree of the craft. In England, the inherent secrecy of the club-like lodges provided the perfect facility 
for undercover intrigue against the Whigs in the German succession. Throughout the land, the Jacobite societies and Tory lodges became closely entwined, as a result of which they became prime targets for Whig intelligence, whose high-ranking Secret Service operatives duly infiltrated the fraternities. In later years, English Freemasonry dispensed with political intrigue to become more concerned with allegorical representation in the codes of brotherly love, faith, and charity. And if you believe that, you're not playing with a full deck of cards. That's what they want you to believe. That's what he wants you to believe. But it's not true. He continues, In Europe, however, many scientifically based intellectual lodges of the traditional style are still extant. In 1817, a Dr. Robert Watson purchased in Rome some of Cardinal Henry's documents concerning the Stuart dynasty. He paid 20, 23 pounds sterling, equivalent to about 610 pounds today, which is probably around $1,200 U.S. dollars, and prepared to publish the contents. But before he had a chance to do this, the files were seized by the papal police and passed to London so that their contents would not become known. Sometime later, the doctor received a payment from Westminster for having been deprived of his property. Not content with this, Watson pursued his right to the papers, only to be found dead, supposedly having committed suicide in 1838. The papers have never since appeared in the public domain. Along with Cardinal Henry, the Abbey Waters also lost his possessions and became a pensioner of King George. Waters, an executor for Charlotte of Albany, was the custodian of various other Stuart papers. His guardianship, of which constituted the route to his future Hanoverian income, and in 1805 the Abbey was obliged to pass them over to the British government. At length, some were deposited at Windsor Castle, where they remain today. As for the rest, their whereabouts are conveniently unknown. And, uh, folks, if I had to make a bet, remember the fire they had at Windsor Castle? Remember that fire? If I had to make a bet, <laughs> I'd bet those papers were all burned. Anything that would legitimize the claim to the throne by the House of Stuart was most probably destroyed in that fire. By virtue of these documentary acquisitions, the way was deemed clear for Prince Edward James to be totally excluded from historical records in Britain. But this was not the case in continental Europe, where he is well documented in papers held by the Stuart trustees and features in the writings of René Vicomte Chateaubriand, Abbey James Waters, Princess Caroline Murat, and others. Although the Stuarts have been ignored by the British authorities since the death of Cardinal Henry, the descendants of Prince Edward James, Count Stuarton, second Count of Albany, have been actively engaged in social, political, military, and sovereign affairs for the past two centuries. They have often advised governments on constitutional and diplomatic matters in an effort to promote the ideals of public service and religious toleration as upheld by their own reigning house, and they have been particularly concerned with matters of trade, welfare, and education. In 1888, Prince Edward's grandson, Charles Benedict James Stewart, 4th Count of Albany, was scheduled to visit Britain. He was due to attend a grand Stuart exhibition at the New Gallery, London. It was sponsored by the Order of the White Rose, and the main organizers were Bertram, Earl of Ashburnham, and Melville Massieu, Marquis de Rouvigny, but the exhibition was wholly undermined by Hanoverian agents, and Prince Charles Benedict, guess what, was found dead, presumed murdered, in Italy. There was no display in 1888 after all. A rather different exhibition was held the following year. Instead of being in honor of the Stuarts as was planned, it was promoted to celebrate the bicentenary of the Whig Revolution, which had deposed James the Seventh, which uh, would be the second, and the Stuarts in 1688. The exhibition's new patron was Queen Victoria herself, 
and the event was used as a cover to obtain even more valuable documents of Stuart heritage. Having been ousted from their patronage, Lord Ashburnham and the Marquis de Ruvigny directed their future interests towards the chivalric societies of Europe, the Order of the Realm of Sion, the Knights Protectors of the Sacred Sepulchre, and the Order of the Sangreal. Governor... <laughs> Uh, the governor of Oklahoma, ladies and gentlemen, who was the governor at the time of the bombing of the Alfred P. Muir Federal Building, is a member of the Knights Protectors of the Sacred Sepulchre. And, uh, you know, <laughs> you might, uh, you might uh, want to uh, pursue some of that. Who knows? Don't go away. I'll be right back after uh, I rest my throat for a second, get a little drink of water, and we'll continue. <laughs> finish this today. We'll finish it, wrap it up tomorrow. It's just one very small chapter. It's 12 pages at the, at the toward the end of the book. And we're doing it as a book report to encourage you to go buy this book and read it. It's extremely interesting and it will give you a real big clue as to what the Illuminati wants you to believe and what will be coming you know, within a few years on the world scene. And uh, believe me, it will be Coming, folks. Uh, you just, you've got to uh, understand that somehow. In spite of Queen Victoria's efforts to suppress Stuart popularity, there was a significant Jacobite revival in the late 1800s. The Queen's advisors therefore sought to emphasize her tenuous claim to Stuart descent to the exclusion of the Stuarts' own Scottish heritage. As a result, 
Thane, Banco, and the Scots line from King Alpin disappeared from the Hanoverians' readjusted Stuart registers. The Lord Lyon, King of Arms, subsequently wrote the traditional account of the descent of the family from Banco, Thane of Lochaber, and through him from the ancient kings of Scotland is now generally discredited. From that time, the Stuarts' Breton line was brought wholly to the fore. But why anyone should have to discredit one line of a descent in order to promote another is beyond ordinary understanding. Everyone has at least two lines of immediate descent, and the Stuarts, of course, were no exception. Subsequent members of the Scots' royal family were prominent in the Belgian resistance during World War II. Hubert Pirlot, Prime Minister of Belgium, was a close friend of the Stuarts, who had reverted to the original spelling of their name in 1892. In that year, they had moved to the Chateau du Moulin in the Belgian Ardennes, where they lived until 1968. This castle had originally been given to the family in 1692 by King Louis XIV. As recently as 1982, the city of Brussels honored the Stuarts with a grand reception. Then, on 14 December 1990, the Brussels registrars signed, sealed, and authenticated an updated charter of the Royal House of Stuart, detailing the complete family descent from the time of Robert the Bruce down to date. Today, there are several lines descended from Prince Edward James, second Count of Albany. They include the Counts of Dernelli and the Dukes of Coldingham. Foremost, however, in the main line of legitimate descent from Charles Edward Stuart and his son Edward James is the present seventh Count of Albany, Prince Michael James Alexander Stuart, Duke de Aquitaine, Comte de Blois, head of the Sacred Kindred of St. Columba, Grand, excuse me, Knight Grand Commander of the Order of the Temple of Jerusalem, Patron Grand Officer of the International Society of Commission Officers for the Commonwealth, and President of the European Council of Princes. Prince Michael's own compelling book, Scotland, The Forgotten Kingdom, a thoroughly detailed and politically corrected history of the Scots' world descent, is now in the course of preparation. <laughs> of course it is. This senior Stuart descent goes all the way back to King Arthur's father, King Aidan of Scots, on the one hand, and to Prince Nacien of the Septimanian Midi on the other. The Scots' descent traces further back through King Lucius of Siluria to Bran the Blessed and Joseph of Arimathea, St. James the Just, while the Midi succession stems from the Merovingians' male ancestral line through the Fisher Kings to Jesus and Mary Magdalene. See, what did I tell you? And I told you this was going to happen years ago before this guy ever dreamed of writing this book. I told you that this was going to happen. I told you that they would make this case. And I told you, well, I told you, folks. And it's all on tape. All of it. I hate to be right. I really do. I hate to be right so much. And it's not because I have a crystal ball or I'm psychic or I can see this. because I study. I study and I study and I study and I study. I study history. I study what's happening today. And, uh, you know, if you do that, you can't help but come to the right conclusions. Because nothing is really hidden. It's all there for anybody who wants to dig for it. So most people are just too lazy to do it. Let me continue. We might get through this today. I don't know. Maybe. No, I don't think so. We'll have to finish tomorrow. But anyway, let me continue. In joining the lines from their first century points of departure, the descent is in the succession of the royal house of Judah. This is a truly unique line of sovereign lineage from King David in one of the key descents which comprise the bloodline of the Holy Grail. Now, let me tell you what's really behind this, ladies and gentlemen. Behind this, and you better listen to me carefully, is pure Zionism. The concept that there is a divine race chosen by God to rule over all other races and all other people in the world, and that this divine right to rule was given to David, and that his descendants 
which they now call British Israelism, our Christian identity, and the uh, the uh, oh, what do you call it? The radical sect of Judaism, Messianic Judaism, are all combined to claim that the Anglo-Aryan race is the real, true Israel, and is destined to rule the world. And uh, in case you belong to the Mormon Church and you think this applies to you, it doesn't, folks, because it's not going to be in uh, Missouri or Illinois where this new Jerusalem is. It's going to be in the real Jerusalem is where these people want it to be. And the wealth, the real power behind the throne, will be in the one-mile square city of London known as the British Crown. Got that, guys? <laughs> the one-mile square city of London is not subject to the rule of the Queen. It is known as the Crown of England. It is a separate sovereignty altogether, and it is a creation of Freemasonry, and there are more Freemasonic lodges in that one square mile of London, known as the Crown of England, than there is in all of the United States put together. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. And now we get to the role of America in all of this. The Crown of America. Beneath the streets of Rome, the catacombs of the pagan era hold the remains of more than six million Christians. Laid in a single row, the passages would extend for 550 miles, or 880 kilometers. Ironically, the later fanaticism of the Inquisitions accounted for more than a million additional lives because the victims were supposedly not Christian. Through the centuries, millions of Jews have been persecuted and killed as a result of anti-Semitism initiated by the early Christian church. This was managed mostly under cover of the accusation of deicide. It ran completely out of control during the Holocaust of the early 1940s. But anti-Semitism still lingers. Tens of millions of Soviet Russian lives were lost during Stalin's brutal dictatorship an autocratic totalitarianism that despised religion in any form. The Soviet Union was a Masonic state, ladies and gentlemen, and they always will despise religion in any form. In fact, their goal is to completely abolish all religions save their secular humanist religion. Vast numbers such as these are beyond the bounds of practical imagination but their memory cannot be confined to savage regimes of the past. Worldwide religious feuds continue, just as in the days of old, and the ethnic cleansing of the Inquisition is still apparent today, and uh, the place where it's most apparent, or places I should say, are most probably what is known as Bosnia and Ireland. In theory, communism was introduced to fulfill a socialist ambition. But the dream soon died as the giant machine rose to power by military oppression. Capitalism, on the other hand, is equally ruthless because it venerates balance sheets above the welfare of people. As a result, millions are condemned to starve to death in the poorer regions, while vast food mountains stockpile elsewhere. <coughs> and folks, lest you think he was uh, pinging on communism, socialism, he's not. They are communists and socialists. And this idea that Capitalism results in, in, uh, in millions of people starving to death in poorer regions while vast food mountains stockpile elsewhere is a socialist communist idea. And it's not true at all. <clears throat> Even in the United States, he says, where the Constitution promotes the ideal of liberty and equality, we see an ever-widening gap between the privileged and subordinate groups. Rich communities are now barricading themselves within walled environments while the welfare systems of the West are crumbling into bankruptcy. History has proved many times over 
that absolute rule by monarchs or dictators is a road to social disparity. Yet the democratic alternative of elected government has often proved similarly inequitable. Even elected parliaments can become egotistic and dictatorial in a world where those entrusted to serve may regard themselves instead as the masters. Now listen very carefully because he's laying the foundation for the world to accept a Messiah King of the bloodline that he has documented in this book. Pay very close attention. Additionally, in countries such as Britain that have a multi-party political structure, the people are regularly faced with the rule of ministers empowered by a minority vote. In such circumstances, who is there to champion the rights of individuals? Trade unions, some might say. But quite apart from being politically biased in themselves, such organizations are still subject to government control. Although they may have a weight of membership, they have no final authority to equal that of Parliament. As far as the judicial system is concerned, its purpose is to uphold legal justice, not moral justice. Others in Britain may cite the Queen as the people's guardian, but Britain has a parliamentary monarchy in which the sovereign reigns only by consent of Westminster. Given the lack of any written constitution, British monarchs are quite powerless to champion individual rights and liberties to any effect. The present heir to the throne has genuinely sought to bypass the restrictions by speaking out from time to time, only to suffer recriminations from the establishment. Like a Victorian child, he is supposed to be seen and not heard, while bankers and industrialists control the fate of the nation. So often one hears politicians quoting the British Constitution as if it actually exists by way of a documentary privilege, but it does not. It is simply an accumulation of old customs and precedents concerning parliamentary sanctions together with a number of specific laws defining certain aspects. Since Scotland's 1320 Declaration of Arbroath was nullified by England's Treaty of Union in 1707, the oldest written constitution now in force is that of the United States of America. It was adopted in 1787, ratified in 1788, and effected in 1789. In that same year began the French Revolution, which abolished feudalism and absolute monarchy in France, thereby influencing politics in much of Europe. Remember I told you that uh, the Founding Fathers established the United States of America in order to set the common man free, make him a king in his own right, so that it would topple the kings and queens off of the thrones of Europe, and that's exactly what it did, and that's exactly what he acknowledges right here. And that's the truth of it. That's what it was supposed to do, and that's exactly what it did. He continues, In close to 200 years since the Revolution, France and other European states, with Britain as a noticeable exception, have adopted written constitutions to protect the rights and liberties of individuals. But who champions these constitutions on behalf of the people? <laughs> I do, folks. You all know that. But there really isn't too many others, you know, other people like me. We have no power. He continues, A popular alternative to absolute monarchy or dictatorship has been found in republicanism. The Republic of the United States was created primarily to free the emergent nation from the despotism of Britain's House of Hanover. Yet its citizens tend still to be fascinated by the concept of monarchy. We got to close there, folks. We'll continue this tomorrow. Now, remember, all that I didn't tell you right now is leading up to his justification of putting a king upon the throne of the world to protect the rights of individuals around the world and champion the constitution of the New World Order, which, in effect, is the United Nations Charter and doesn't guarantee any rights for anybody. Good night, folks, and God bless each and every single one of you.
Some say love, it is a hunger, an endless aching need. I say love, it is a flower, and you, it's all. to the hour of the time I'm William Cooper and what an hour it is and uh, what a time it is ladies and gentlemen we are living literally in one of the great turning points of history and uh, the future is going to be one of the most magnificent wonderful events that has ever transpired or we are going to slide backwards into the darkest most dismal slavery that the world has ever known. And uh, everyone knows that there is something terribly wrong, but only a few of us are able to put our finger on it, give it a name, and point the finger at those responsible. Don't go away. I'll be right back, and we will continue with part two of our book report on Bloodline of the Holy Grail. The Hidden Lineage of Jesus Revealed by Lawrence 
Gardner with a forward by Prince Michael of Albany. We left off yesterday where Lawrence Gardner was building the case for the world to accept a Messiah King from the bloodline that he and other orders of the Illuminati claim is a direct descendant through Jesus Christ to the legendary and biblical house of David, which was given the divine right to rule by God. The only problem, as I pointed out yesterday, is in his doing this, it is one of the more successful attempts at getting people to disregard the legitimacy of the Holy Bible or Christianity, because that is the target. Now, in presenting this broadcast, I am not defending the Bible or Christianity. I'm merely pointing out one of the more successful agendas of the Illuminati in destroying all existing nation states, all existing religions save theirs, and the bringing about of the shackling of the mob, the profane. That's you, in case you wondered. In the birth of a new world order, a one world totalitarian socialist government. off yesterday when they're bringing the role of the United States into all of this. And you're going to find it extremely interesting if you really care about learning what's going on in the world, what's driving it, and who's responsible. If you don't know those things, you certainly can't fight the battle. You don't even know where the battlefield is at or who the enemy is. They're just running around bumping into each other. And uh, that spells death for any military or army or people that I have ever studied in history. So let me back up just uh, one paragraph so that we at least overlap a little bit. Remember, this is a book report. I'm just reading to you a little bit, very tiny bit of this book called The Bloodline of the Holy Grail, The Hidden Lineage of Jesus Revealed by Lawrence Gardner. With a forward by Prince Michael of Albany. Lawrence Gardner is the prior of the Celtic Church's Sacred Kindred of St. Columba, is an internationally known sovereign and chivalric genealogist. He is distinguished as the Chevalier Labrun de Saint Germain. He is presidential attache to the European Council of Princes, which is a constitutional advisory body established in 1946. He is formally attached to the Noble Household Guard of the Royal House of Stuart, founded at St. Germain in Ley in 1692. And get this, folks, he is the Jacobite Historiographer Royal, which means he's responsible for the royal history of the Illuminati. So you better listen to what this man has to say. And I'm quoting directly from the book. 
A popular alternative to absolute monarchy or dictatorship has been found in republicanism. The Republic of the United States was created primarily to free the emergent nation from the despotism of Britain's House of Hanover. Yet its citizens still tend to be fascinated by the concept of monarchy. No matter how Republican the spirit, the need for a central symbol remains. Neither a flag nor a president can fulfill this unifying role, for by virtue of the party system, presidents are always politically motivated. Republicanism was devised on the principle of fraternal status, yet an ideally classless society can never exist in an environment that promotes displays of eminence and superiority by degrees of wealth and possession. Now here you have a clue of what he's really leading to, folks, because nobody ever said that this was supposed to be a classless society or a classless nation. What the Founding Fathers says, all men are created equal. They should have the same opportunities, the same rights. It doesn't mean that they have the same ability, the same intelligence, or that they're going to rise to the same level or station in life or in society. But it gave us the opportunity to do that. He talks about an ideally classless society, which confirms everything I've been telling you about the heart and soul of these people being socialist communists. He continues, For the most part, and listen to this very carefully because it confirms everything that I've been teaching you, for the most part, those responsible for the United States' morally inspired constitution were Rosicrucians and Freemasons. Notable characters such as George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and Charles Thompson. The last, who designed the Great Seal of the United States of America, was a member of Franklin's American Philosophical Society, a counterpart of Britain's Invisible College. The imagery of the seal is directly related to alchemical tradition, inherited from the allegory of the ancient Egyptian therapeutate. The eagle, the olive branch, the arrows, and the pentagrams are all occult symbols of opposites, good and evil, male and female, war and peace, darkness and light. On the reverse, as repeated on the dollar bill, is the truncated pyramid indicating the loss of the old wisdom, severed and forced underground by the church establishment. But above this are the rays of ever-hopeful light incorporating the all-seeing eye used as a symbol during the French Revolution. In establishing their republic, the Americans could still not escape the ideal of a parallel monarchy, a central focus of non-political patriotic attachment. George Washington was actually offered kingship, but declined because he had no immediately qualifying heritage. Instead, he turned to the royal house of Stuart. In November of 1782, four Americans arrived in the San Clemente Palazzo in Florence, the residence of Charles III Stuart in exile. They were Mr. Galloway of Maryland, two brothers named Sylvester from Pennsylvania, and Mr. Fish, a lawyer from New York. They were taken to Charles Edward by his secretary, John Stewart. Also present was the Honorable Charles Hervey Townsend, later Britain's ambassador to The Hague, and the Prince's future wife, Marguerite, Comtessa de Macelan. The interview, which revolved around the contemporary transatlantic dilemma, is documented in the United States Senate archives and in the Manor Water Papers. Writers such as Sir Compton Mackenzie and Sir Charles Petrie have also described the occasion when Charles Edward Stewart was invited to become King of the Americans. Some years earlier, Charles had been similarly approached by the men of Boston, but once the War of Independence was over, George Washington sent his own envoys. It would have been a great irony for the House of Hanover to lose the North American colonies to the Stuarts, but Charles declined the offer for a number of reasons, not the least of which was his lack of a legitimate male heir at the time. 
He knew that without a due successor, the United States could easily fall to Hanover again at his death, thereby defeating the whole independence effort. Since those days, many other radical events have taken place. The French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, two major world wars and a host of changes as countries have swapped one style of government for another. Meanwhile, civil and international disputes continue just as they did in the Middle Ages. They're motivated by trade, politics, religion and whatever other banners are flown to justify the constant struggle for territorial and economic control. The Holy Roman Empire has disappeared, the German rights have failed, and the British Empire has collapsed. The Russian Empire fell to communism, which has itself been disgraced and crumbled to ruin, while capitalism teeters on the very brink of acceptability. With the Cold War now ended, America faces a new threat to her super sour power status from the Pacific countries. In the meantime, the nations of Europe band together in what was once a seemingly well-conceived economic community, but which is already suffering from the same pressures of individual custom and national sovereignty that beset the Holy Roman Empire. Whether nations are governed by military-style regimes, are elected parliaments by autocrats or democrats, and whether formally described as monarchist, socialist, or republican, the net product is always the same. The few control the fate of the many. In situations of dictatorship, this is a natural experience, but it should not be the case in a democratic institution based on the principle of majority vote. True democracy is government by the people for the people, in either direct or representative form, ignoring class distinctions and tolerating minority views. The American Constitution sets out an ideal for this form of democracy, but in line with other nations, there is always a large sector of the community that is not represented by the party in power. Because presidents and prime ministers are politically tied, and because political parties take their respective turns at individual helms, the inevitable result is a lack of continuity for the nation's concern. This is not necessarily a bad thing, but there is no reliable ongoing institution to champion the civil rights and liberties of people in such conditions of ever-changing leadership. Britain does, at least, retain a monarchy, but it is a politically constrained monarchy, and as such is ineffectual in performing its role as guardian of the nation. The United States, unlike Britain, has a written constitution, but has no one with the power to uphold its principles against successive governments who determinedly pursue their own politically vested interests. Is there an answer to the anomaly? An answer that could bring not just a ray of hope, but a shining light for the future? There certainly is. But its energy relies on those in governmental service appreciating their roles as representatives of society, rather than presuming to stand at the head of society. Alongside the political administration, an appointed constitutional champion would be empowered to keep check on any potential disparities and infringements of the Constitution that might occur. 
This can be achieved in the manner first envisioned by George Washington and the American fathers. Their original plan was for a democratic parliament combined with a working constitutional monarchy bound not to parliament or the church, but to the people and their written constitution. In such an environment, sovereignty would ultimately rest with the people, while the monarch, as an operative guardian of the realm, would pledge an oath of fealty to the nation, not the reverse, as in Britain's case, whereby the nation pays homage to the sovereignty of Parliament and the monarchy. truly William Cooper on 101.1 FM, Eager, Arizona. International Shortwave Radio.
The unfulfilled ambition of the American fathers was that government ministers should be elected by the majority vote of the people, but that their actions be directed within the boundaries of the Constitution. Because that Constitution belongs to the people, its champion, as George Washington perceived, should be a monarch whose obligation is not to politics or religion, but to the sovereign nation. Through the natural system of heredity being born and bred to the task, such a constitutional guardian would provide an ongoing continuity of public representation through successive governments. In this regard, both monarchs and ministers would be servants of the Constitution on behalf of the community of the realm. Such a concept of moral government lies at the very heart of the Grail Code, and it remains within the bounds of possibility for every civilized nation-state. A leading British politician recently claimed that it was not his job to be popular. Not so. A popular minister is a trusted minister, and holding a deserved electoral trust facilitates the democratic process. No minister can honestly expound an ideal of equality in society when that minister is deemed to possess some form of prior lordship over society. Class structure is always decided from above, never from below. It is therefore for those on self-made pedestals to be seen to kick them aside in the interests of harmony and unity. Jesus was not in the least humbled when he washed his apostles' feet. He was raised to the realm of a true grail king, the realm of equality and princely service. This is the eternal precept of the Sangreal, and it is expressed in grail lore with the utmost clarity. Only by asking, Whom does the grail serve? Will the wound of the fisher king be healed, and the wasteland returned to fertility?
confronted Ferdinand and Isabella once more, and this time he won their support. On August the 3rd, 1492, he set sail from Palos with three small ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Eight months later, Columbus returned to Barcelona, but not with the anticipated silks and spices from the east. Instead, he was accompanied by six brown-skinned natives bearing pearls, strange fruits, gold, and exotic birds. He had discovered an exciting new world across the sea, and the Pope declared that these rich lands belonged to Spain. The name America did not emerge for another five years. It derived from the Florentine navigator Amerigo Vespucci, who sailed to the South Continental mainland in 1497. What is almost unknown in the world is that representing Ferdinand and Isabella and the nation of Spain, Christopher Colombo should have planted the flag of Spain when he landed upon the first beach in his voyage. He should have claimed those lands for Spain, but he did not, ladies and gentlemen. He planted a white flag upon which was a green cross. Upon his return, Columbus related that he had landed on Watling Island, now San Salvador, in the Bahamas. He had also visited Hispaniola, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic, and Cuba. Ferdinand and Isabella were delighted, and their hero was offered a seat at the Spanish court. His second voyage, 1493 to 1496, took him to Guadalupe, Antigua, Puerto Rico, and Jamaica. The third voyage of 1498 saw Columbus in Trinidad and on the mainland of South America. Then in 1499, the colonists of Haiti revolted against his command. Consequently, a new Spanish governor was installed, and Columbus was shipped back to Europe in chains. His last voyage in 1502-1504 concerned the coastal exploration of Honduras and Nicaragua, but despite his hour of glory, he died in poverty two years later at Valladolid, and Columbus was buried at Seville in 1542. His remains were eventually removed to Hispaniola. Now this exciting piece of maritime history is well enough known, at least, you know, by a lot of people. What is not so well known is the fact that the New World discovery was no accident. You see, Columbus was fully armed with detailed navigational charts before he set sail. He knew there was land there. He had maps that showed the land. They had been drawn up on previous Atlantic crossings and were vouched for at the Spanish court by John Drummond, whose grandfather had been to America in 1398. Drummond was related to the Drummond Earls of Perth, where the records confirm that he was with Ferdinand and Isabella in 1492. Both Columbus and Drummond had lived on the island of Madeira. Drummond's father, John, the Scott Drummond, had settled there in 1419 along with Columbus's father-in-law, Bartholomew Perestrello. John, the Scots' father, was Sir John Drummond of Stobhall, Justicier of Scotland. Sir John's sister Annabella was the wife of King Robert III, Stuart of Scots. Sir John's own wife was Elizabeth Sinclair, whose nephew, William Sinclair, was the founder of Roslyn Chapel. Elizabeth's father, Henry Sinclair, Baron of Roslyn, Earl of Orkney, led a successful transatlantic expedition nearly a century before Columbus, and even he was not the first. Henry Sinclair's Norse ancestors had explored the Atlantic as far back as the 10th century. In Hawke's book of the Icelandic saga, extant copy dated 1320, Leif Erikson is detailed as having crossed the Atlantic to Wineland the Good in 999. Indeed, the Orkney sailors had reached land to the west within Henry's own lifetime. 
Their reports claimed that the natives of a faraway place called Estotolans sowed corn and exported furs and sulfur to Greenland. Estotolans was the place eventually called Nova Scotia, or New Scotland, in Canada. The Orkney sailors also told of a southern country called Drogio. The natives of Drogio ran naked in the hot winds, but across the sea the people were very refined. Their land was rich in gold, and they had cities and great temples to their gods. Now, these various accounts were all confirmed when voyagers traveled to the Caribbean islands and onwards to Florida and Mexico, the home of the Aztec Indians. In complete disregard of these early discoveries, tradition has it that the Aztec Empire was not explored until the Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés arrived there in 1519. Well, from 1391, the master of Sinclair's fleet was the Venetian sea captain Antonio Zeno. The Zenos were among the oldest families of Venice and were noted admirals and ambassadors from the 8th century. Before Sinclair and Zeno made their own passage across the ocean, Henry drew up a contract with his daughter Elizabeth and her husband, Sir John Drummond. The deed was sealed at Roslyn on May 13, 1396. It empowered Sir John and Elizabeth to claim Henry's Norwegian lands if he and his sons should perish in the expedition. An account of the Sinclair Zeno voyage is to be found in Andrew Sinclair's The Sword and the Grail, pages 108 through 150. In May 1398, the Sinclair fleet set sail. There were 12 warships and a hundred men, some of whom had made the voyage before. Their first port of call was Nova Scotia, where they landed at Cape Blomidon in the Bay of Fundy. Now, even today, the Micmac Indians tell of the incoming ships of the great god Coolscap, who taught them about the stars and how to fish with nets. On his return home to Venice, Antonio Zeno wrote that at this place he had seen streams of pitch running into the sea and a mountain that issued smoke from its base. Now Nova Scotia is certainly very rich in coal, there are exposed coastal seams of pitch where the coal brooks run at asphalt. Nearby, the greasy underground residues often smolder beneath the hills of Cape Smoky. At Louisburg on Cape Breton, there is a primitive cannon found in 1849. It is of the Venetian type, used by Zeno, and, ladies and gentlemen, it is of a style that was quite obsolete by the time of Columbus. From Nova Scotia, Sinclair continued south towards the land of Drogio. Evidence of the journey can be seen at Massachusetts and Rhode Island. At Westford, Massachusetts, where one of Henry's knights died, the grave is still discernible. And punched into a rock ledge is the seven-foot effigy of a 14th century knight wearing a bassinet, chain mail, and a surcoat. The figure bears a sword of the 1300s and a shield with Pentland heraldry. The knight's sword is broken below the hilt, indicative of the customary broken sword that would have been buried with the knight, the same as would laid before Percival in Grail lore. At Newport, Rhode Island, is a well-preserved two-story medieval tower. Its construction an octagon within a circle and eight arches around, is based on the circular model of the Templar churches. Similar remains are to be found at the 12th century Orphir Chapel in Orkney. The Newport architecture is Scottish, and its design is reproduced at the St. Clair Church. Corstorphine, where Henry Sinclair's daughter as her memorial. Rhode Island was not officially founded until 1636, but its founding was no chance event. At the Public Records Office in London, a text dated four years earlier describes the round stone tower at Newport. 
It proposed that the tower be used as a garrison for the soldiers of Sir Edmund Plowden, who colonized that area. Now, more than 50 years after the Sinclair expedition, Christopher Columbus was born into the high age of discovery in Europe. In Portugal, he became a Knight of Christ in the revised Templar order, as did his famous contemporaries Vasco da Gama, Bartolomeu Dias, and Ferdinand Magellan. In short, he was a Knight Templar. He also belonged to the Order of the Crescent, founded by René d'Anjou, also known as the Order of the Ship. The Crescent Knights were particularly concerned with matters of navigation, but had been condemned by the Church for insisting on a very, very minor point, the point that the world was round. Through John Drummond and others, Columbus knew precisely where he was heading, and it was not to Asia. Maps of the transatlantic New World were already in existence within his Templar circle. In particular, he had access to the new globe of the world, which was completed in 1492, precisely the year that he set sail. This globe was produced by the Nuremberg cartographer Martin Behaim. He was a navigational business partner of John Afonso Escorichio, better known, better known, ladies and gentlemen, as John Drummond. secret, although perhaps it's not the most widely known the fact, that the early development of Masonic lodges in Britain, that's in Britain, was directly allied to the House of Stuart, emanating from the archetypal grading of medieval stonemasons by degrees of proficiency, which was a symbolic concept of ritualized masonry evolved during the reign of Charles I, the earliest inductions into free or speculative Masonic lodges were recorded in about 1640. The movement was largely concerned with the structured acquisition of knowledge in unexplained science, much of which had been preserved in Scotland since the time of the original Templars and Cistercian monks. In Stuart, England, the early Freemasons of Charles I and Charles II were men of philosophy, astronomy, physics, architecture, chemistry, and generally advanced learning. Many were members of the country's most important scientific academy, the Royal Society, which had been styled the Invisible College after it was forced underground during the Cromwellian Protectorate. The Society was established under Charles I in 1645 and incorporated under Royal Charter by Charles II in 1662 after the Restoration. 
Early members included Robert Boyle, Isaac Newton, Robert Hook, Christopher Wren, and Samuel Pepys. Now, one only has to consider the accomplishments of the Royal Society to realize that, like the early Templars, they were endowed with very special knowledge. The natural philosopher Robert Boyle, 1627 to 1691, was a noted alchemist, a student of Nostradamus and a leading authority on Grail lore. Boyle supported the mathematical astrologer Galileo Galilei in his avowal of the Copernican heliocentric principle of the solar system, which the uh, Pope didn't much care for. He made many discoveries concerning the properties of air, and of course formulated the very notable Boyle's Law. His colleague, the physicist Robert Hooke, 1635-1703, invented the hairspring, the double air pump, the spirit level, and the marine barometer. Also in the fraternity was the astronomer and geometrician Edmund Haley, who calculated the motion of celestial bodies and accurately predicted the future regular reappearances of Haley's Comet. Isaac Newton, 1642 to 1727, was one of the greatest scientists of all time, renowned in particular for announcing the law of gravity and the definitions of orbital force. He was a noted alchemist, a refiner of the calculus, divisor of the laws of motion, and inventor of the reflecting telescope. One of Newton's foremost studies concerned the structure of the ancient kingdoms, and he claimed the preeminence of the Judaic heritage as an archive of divine knowledge and numerology. Newton was wholly conversant with universal law, sacred geometry, and Gothic, Gothic, I should say, architecture. Although he was a deeply spiritual man and an authority on early religion, he openly rejected the Trinity dogma and the divinity of Jesus, maintaining that the New Testament had been distorted by the church before its publication. Not only was Newton the president of the Royal Society, but he was also a grand helmsman of the priory Notre Dame de Sion. The original order of Sion had been inaugurated by the Knights Templars to accommodate Jews and Muslims within their Christian organization, and until 1188 they shared the same Grand Master. Although the early Templars had a Christian affiliation, they were noted exponents of religious toleration which enabled them to be influential diplomats in both the Jewish and Islamic communities. However, their liberal association with Jews and Muslims was denounced as heresy by the Catholic bishops and was instrumental in the Knights' excommunication by the Church of Rome in 1306. From 1188, the Order of Sion had been restructured and evolved to pursue a more specific course of loyalty to the Merovingian lineage of France. The Templars, on the other hand, were especially concerned with supporting the emergent Stuart succession. In practice, the two operated in close association because they were essentially concerned with the same root bloodline. Another prominent Royal Society member was Sir Christopher Wren, 1632 to 1723, the architect of St. Paul's Cathedral, the Royal Exchange, Greenwich Hospital, the Royal Naval College, the Royal Greenwich Observatory, and numerous other churches, halls, and monuments. He was also an acclaimed <coughs> Excuse me. He was also an acclaimed mathematician and a professor of astronomy. Wren was Grand Master of the Esoteric Order of Rosicrucians. So too had been Robert Boyle and the Lord Chancellor Sir Francis Bacon. Other Rosicrucian Grand Masters included Benjamin Franklin, 1706 to 1790, who distinguished between positive and negative electricity, and Thomas Jefferson, the third President of the United States of America, term of office 1801 to 1809. Benjamin Franklin was also the master of the Lodge of Nine Muses while he was a diplomatic representative of the United States to France and England. 
Modern historians have an unfortunate habit of extolling certain virtues of such great and learned men while paying absolutely no attention to the root sources of their wisdom. They are explicitly described as artists, scientists, politicians, or whatever. But from Leonardo to Newton, and from Newton to Franklin, their common interests were hermetic alchemy. They were deists, and they engaged in what they called the sacred craft. In fact, their various revelations were not necessarily first-time discoveries. They were more the products of studying what they call cosmic laws and equations of very ancient origin. As an organized group, the men were able to assist each other with translation, experiment, and the development. The story of Newton and the falling apple may well add a little memorable humor to the law of gravity, but Newton admitted the true source of this inspiration to be Pythagoras' music of the spheres, a concept dating from the 6th century B.C. In Britain, and during their later exile, the Stuart kings were at the very forefront of Scottish Rite Freemasonry, which was founded on the most ancient of all arcane knowledge and universal law. Their Breton heritage was closely allied to the noble families of Boulogne and Jerusalem, and their background was largely Templar-inspired. So it should come as no surprise that it was under Charles I and Charles II who posed such a problem to the narrow-minded Puritans in the Anglican Church, that the Invisible College of the Royal Society emerged, a college that within a brief period of Stuart patronage revealed some of the greatest scientific discoveries of all time, and in modern times spawned the Royal Institute of International Affairs and the Council on Foreign Relations. Good night, ladies and gentlemen, and God bless each and every single one of you. And, if you can afford it, get this book that this book review broadcast was all about, Bloodline of the Holy Grail, The Hidden Lineage of Jesus Revealed by Lawrence Gardner. doesn't matter whether you believe this guy or not, you'd better understand the scam that the Illuminati is attempting to pull off on the world. And you would be absolutely amazed at how many people actually believe all of this baloney to be true. It is, in fact, an international bestseller.
You've been listening to The Hour of the Time with yours truly, William Cooper, on 101.1 FM Eager, a non-profit community service radio station, and worldwide on WRMI, worldwide shortwave radio, 9.955 megahertz. Thank you.